Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of IEEE Pune's podcast Beyond Conversations. Our guest for today is Saptarshi Ghosh. Saptarshi is a highly accomplished professional working as a system on chip design engineer at Intel focusing on cutting edge technology particularly AI enabled Intel's Xeon processors. His role involves innovating and pushing the boundaries of computing technology. Academically, he has a strong foundation having earned a master's degree in electrical engineering and computer sciences from UC Berkeley, one of the top engineering schools in the US. Additionally, he holds a leadership position as chair of the students and young professionals in the IEEE Computer Society, an organization with a global reach of over 300,000 members. We had an extremely spirited conversation about the whole field of system on chip and hardware design engineering. It's a rare conversation and we hope that you'll watch this till the end. A lot of students in India have this mentality that they want to pursue a computer engineering degree. That's always their first choice. So why did you decide to pursue a degree in electronics engineering? Uh, what were your motivations and what were your thoughts? before making that decision? Uh, listen, I think uh, that's a great question. I mean no disrespect to people who love software engineering, but there is just a different level of satisfaction in building <laughs> real products in your hand and how coming it see, uh, see it come alive. It's really a very gratifying feeling and I really got addicted to it. So I think it's a story when my dad, uh, when I was like, I think 11 years old, my dad bought me a soldering iron from like a local uh, market and I took that and I spent the whole day kind of burning my hands and kind of building a first prototype uh, which was really fun at that time and then that kind of got me addicted and got me thinking how can I learn more about this and that kind of led me to pursue a whole career in that right so that's what it is okay uh, let's let's move on to the next question so um, a lot of superpowers in the world, most of the global past today, are focusing on chip design and chip manufacturing. So what changes do you think that has brought into the industry? Uh, and what do you think are some cutting-edge technologies that you're seeing today? Right. So this is a very uh, charged question because there has been so much going around the chip design industry. First of all, I think the world for the first time understood the importance of semiconductors during the COVID chip crisis when you could not buy anything. Like here in the US, the prices of the car went up 10, 15, 20% just because there was not enough semiconductors to power it. That's, I think, when the world first realized, all right, semiconductors are super important and we need a good supply of semiconductors. And that's when yeah. like uh, the industry shifted in terms of building more capacity here at Intel we uh, got a grant from the U.S. government, which gave us uh, billions of dollars to build out uh, facilities here in the U.S. and in Europe. So uh, I think there has been a massive shift in building capacity for semiconductors, which was not so much in the past. Earlier, we ha used to have a lot of semiconductor manufacturing, but I think there has been doubled down effort by the uh, Western world to build supply chains in their own countries. And... Partly of that is because most of the world semiconductor, leading semiconductors comes from Taiwan, a company known as TSMC. They build all the latest Apple iPhone chips, all the NVIDIA uh, GPUs, and every, pretty much all the leading edge technology comes from um, Taiwan. And what the world thought was that that's kind of risky because with COVID and the way they saw uh, disruption in the local region that could be mean really bad things for the world. Mm -hmm. The Western world decided to spend a lot of money and grants trying to build out a supply chain infrastructure, which we are seeing uh, today. Right? It's been a really yeah. exciting time to be in this space because everything is changing super fast. I think there are a lot of people uh, trying to come up with startups and a lot of uh, just buzz going around the industry. Mm -hmm. But I think this, the the uh, this, this common theme which unites everything is the world wants a dependable supply chain for semiconductors, which is what everyone is trying to do at this point. 
Hey, that's that's a really wholesome answer to you know what changes you can see in terms of the world shifting towards semiconductor industry today. Um, my next question is about so you as a student when you started out as an engineering student, or when any student in India starts out, there's an abundance of projects that's related to software. You can go on absolutely any website, go on YouTube, and you'll find dozens of projects or suggestions regarding, you know, this is some kind of project that you can make. So as a hardware engineer, you don't find that abundance of resources that easily. So how did you shape your projects during your uh, electronics engineering degree? Uh, where did you find the resources? And what were your motivations behind creating, let's say, a certain project? All right. Fantastic question. And I think uh, when I was starting out, there was definitely a dirt of resources available for uh, learning more about the space. And unlike mm -hmm. software engineers who have a bunch of GitHub projects, open source tutorials, like pretty much anything out of the sun in software engineering, you can look up with a, with a Google search. In hardware, that's not the case. And I think the fundamental reason for that is first, the industry is much smaller. There's not that mm -hmm. many hardware engineers, so there's not enough need to train hardware engineers as much. And second, I think it's a really difficult domain. So uh, I, I say difficult with a, uh, with a twist here because uh, there have been cases where a lot of people who don't have any background in software are able to understand and learn the software fundamentals yeah. and get yeah. jobs at bank companies, right? Like you've seen that hundreds of times, thousands of cases. And Really, that's because uh, software engineering, to a lot of extent, has a lot to do with logic and you know a lot to do with uh, concepts, which are somewhat easily accessible and easily uh, repli replicatable in environments. Mm -hmm. So you could quickly look up Python and you can learn libraries and you can import and within less than a day you can build up a website. You could build up something, but semiconductors is especially the the technology we work on right now. It's really tough. Like think about it. Intel is working on uh, our pro our leading process node is 18 Armstrong. So that's the width. Uh, technically, that's supposed to be the width of a gate in, um, in of a transistor. And if you think about a, a, a semi uh, semiconductor chip, which is about this high, uh, this size, it has billions, maybe tens and tens of billions of transistors, yeah. and each one of them has to work correctly to make the whole chip come to uh, come alive, right? And there's a lot of really difficult challenges we have to overcome because we are kind of at the edge of physics, right? We can't expect that uh, this to be easy, right? All these AI applications that the semiconductor uh, and the software industry, uh, and even the platform we are recording on right now depends on these semiconductors and these processes to run millions and billions of times each second processing instructions without any failure and that's really not that easy like thinking about it right but i think two very good resources if you if anyone wants to start out mm -hmm. learning about it is really a open source first is an open source project called risk 5 uh okay. risk 5 comes out of research at uc berkeley it's an open source cpu uh, mm -hmm. which anyone can download and there's a lot of work going on in that. It's just like a mm -hmm. very popular software project. You can learn a lot about uh, how a CPU works. It's not easy, but there is definitely a good open source framework for that. And second, what I really think right now is mm -hmm. uh, you can buy a lot of hardware development boards, for example, uh, Xilinx FPGA development boards, or maybe your yeah. local university or your, um, or I IEEE has some programs which they can uh, help get these boards. And then you can really kind of program and build your semiconductor through a free programmable gate array. And it's, it's not as easy as uh, Hello World in Python, but it's something people can really do, right? And uh, I think it's, these are two great resources to start with. That's that's great. I'm sure a lot of our audience will find great insight by this answer in terms of, you know, where to look for the kind of projects in hardware that they want to do. Uh, that's that's a great answer. So moving on, can you tell us some of your projects and some of the skills that you built during your engineering degree? 
uh, in order to get the really lucrative internships uh, or the opportunities that you worked at, for example, whether it was Honeywell or Indian Institute of Science. So what were the skills that you were building or what do you think were some projects that, you know, made you stand out? I think the first thing I would like to highlight here is there's a huge amount of luck involved in anything you do. So I don't think that uh, anyone should disregard that, right? So of course. luck is a very important part when you look at opportunities and you never know what's coming your way. And I think the only way to maximize luck is trying to put yourself out there to as reach out to as many people as you can. Do your do your bit, right? In terms of uh, like making noise, making a lot of hustle, right? So that's the part mm-hmm. which you need to do irrespective of the skills you build. But if you talk about hard skills, I think RTL design is super important. Understanding the fundamentals of digital design, logic gates, how how to optimize logic, how flip-flops work, how sequential versus combinational logic comes out. It's very basics, but very important and something I use in my job even today as a silicon and design engineer at Intel. Uh, I think a lot of fundamental concepts really apply to your day-to-day job. And I think the most important skill you need to learn in this space is humility. And I say that in a in a in a in a very uh, meaningful way, as in this space is so difficult and so complex that you cannot come in here in a day and expect to learn all the skills necessary. It takes true. engineers years and decades to really master their craft and. These are some of the smartest engineers I've ever worked with. And I know that even today, they are like, I have no idea how this works. And I have, can you, can you teach me about it? So like having that humility is very important. And I think the best way to do that and really build your skills is building the same projects, right? Trying to build, find your friends and build a RISC-V project, try to program something on a Xilinx FPGA or Arduino or whatever, right? Just trying to get your hands dirty and being humble about it, right? Like, it's okay if you're wrong. It's okay if you are making a mistake in that case because everyone does it. That's, again, a really insightful answer. I am an electronics engineer and I find that a lot of the labs that I have to do, if they're software labs, you pretty much do it within an hour. But if it's a hardware lab, that same experiment goes on for two or three successive turns. And it is kind of challenging. Uh, I mean, I'd like you to tell us about what it means to be an ASIC engineer or a silicon design engineer. What does your day look like? Uh, and, and I mean, what does it entail uh, for the industry today? Uh, or what does it entail in the tech world today? Right. So being a silicon design engineer or ASIC, ASIC design engineer, means that you are effectively designing what these billions of transistors look like at a very high level, right? You're saying, uh, I like to use the analogy of a silicon uh, chip as a city, right? So just like a city, you have skyscrapers, right? You have skyscrapers, you have roads, you have metros, really thinking of a chip as a city. And you are the architect of the city. You decide that, okay, this is what I want my city to do like, will look like. These are the number of highways I want to build and these are the, how the city will look at the end of the day. And that's a great analogy to first think of in a high-level perspective. And then then when you start looking at each building, it's like, okay, so this building is supposed to be a metro station, for example. This building has to handle a lot of traffic. So that would be probably something like your memory technology, right? Your memory controller. Or sometimes you might have administrative buildings like where you have to handle a lot of in and out. So that could be something like your uh, arithmetic logic unit. Basic concepts, which understanding design is being an architect, understanding the bigger picture, why you are doing what you're doing. It's not about writing line of code and then deciding where it fits, but trying to design your city, trying to design what it stands for, what it means, right? That's, that's a super analogy and I think it really works in terms of, you know, how you can creatively think about things that are very, very technical. Uh, I'd like to move on right. to your your decision to pursue a degree at UC Berkeley. Why specifically there? 
uh, and what do you think are your biggest takeaways from your degree there? Right, so this is a very exciting question for me because I was not going to apply for EC Berkeley um, because okay. it turns out uh, I was I was I was kind of like uh, like a very hopeful student, right? Because I was I just completed my undergrad and I wanted to study in the US, and I was like, why will any of these top universities um, really take me? Like, what do I have, right? And then uh, I think I. I had like a consultancy company in India, which was trying to tell me uh, what are my colleges. They looked at my resume and said, okay, you should apply for like these colleges. And I said, yeah, I want to apply for like, I think I had a list of five, six colleges, which included Berkeley, Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I think Purdue University uh, it had Georgia Tech, like five or six good ones. And I remember I was on the call with this uh, consultant and they were like, you must be out of your mind to be applied to these places. <laughs> yes, they said that. And and I was so disheartened and I felt like, oh my God, like maybe it, maybe they're right. Because when you're in a moment of doubt, you really believe someone is saying nothing negative to you, right? Like, yeah, so, so they gave me a university, which I have never even heard about. And they said, that's your dream yeah. university. And I felt really demotivated, right? But at that point, my dad was like, you should apply for the best. And I think that's where a lot of people lose their battle is they don't even apply, right? So these universities with these consultants told I would never be able to apply. Out of these five universities, I got acceptance at all four other than Sanford. Oh so that was uh, that was insane because I that was the first time when I realized that uh, you are the first person who shells you short. Like, if I believe that I can't, I would have never applied to UC Berkeley. And, and really, UC Berkeley was a very easy decision for me because mm -hmm. uh, first, it's in California. Uh, it's connected to the Silicon Valley. It's very close to San Francisco. And it's really part of this exciting space to be. The weather is great and everything. The people are friendly. You know, uh, it's really an amazing place to be in. And being a student was probably the best experience of my life, right? So highly recommend. That's true. You the door never opens unless you knock on it. I think that's that's one of the takeaways about what you're trying to say. But what did you learn at UC Berkeley uh, that you think was you know something that you wouldn't have learned any place else? Right, great question. Because to take ninety five percent of what I learned in my undergrad did not come to use. That's just the hard reality of it, right? So I thought a lot of education systems are just prepare you to teach you a lot of bunch of stuff, but which doesn't really get used anywhere. UC Berkeley was different, especially my professor. Um, the classes he was taking, I was interviewing for uh, each other that time with that exact same thing. I did not have to study a thing outside. And so they were like teaching stuff which was directly relevant to the industry. So super up to date, right? And I think one of the biggest skills I learned at UC Berkeley was, you know, understanding that projects take a lot of time. Like a good project is a lot of like, you know, serious effort in in focus direction. So like one thing Berkeley was really good at was providing us support and our direction. So they were like, okay, you have to build this processor. Uh, this is what the processor would look like. These are the support TAs who will help you. And they gave us like two months and then we worked all night for that project. But you know, since we knew what we were working towards, that really helped. And that's something really powerful about the US education system is it really en empowers everyone to be successful. So I definitely learned a lot in terms of that project and a lot of other fun, uh, exciting professors and courses here at Berkeley, right? Thanks for sharing your experience at Berkeley with us. Uh, I think your answer also says a lot about why so many Indian students are gravitating towards getting an MS in engineering degree abroad because the methods of teaching and the methods of learning are so different from what we see here in India. Uh, coming to my next question, there's, there's one very pertinent question that students have before moving abroad, uh, especially because now you see that the job market is a little difficult and so many students are talking about how difficult it is to land a job in the US because there aren't many uh, on-campus placement opportunities. 
or rather you have to do a lot of networking to get your foot in the door and to get that one interview uh so could you tell us about the skills the qualities and the methods that you applied in order to get a job at intel which is your first job uh in the us right if you look at it like that i think you're 100% right that there's no call campusing there's no call university it's no companies coming to your universities and interviewing you it's really you are on your own the college provides some support in terms of like putting your resumes in the right place and reviewing it but it's really you who has to build the connections and apply for jobs so it's definitely more challenging if you're not used to that right and uh i think the biggest challenge i faced was like i did not know how to make these connections i didn't know how to approach these recruiters which is where a lot of my friends and a lot of you know uh the the network at Berkeley was very supportive in saying like in america it's okay to stop someone in the middle of the road and say hey okay uh, this is what i'm talking this is what i'm working on do you think you'd be interested in in uh hiring someone like me or uh can you tell me about more roles which are open at your company right and ask for referrals be shameless about it like i'm a student of berkeley i'm a student of xyz university i'm excited about this i love the work that you're doing can you please refer me to your company for this role a lot of people will say yes even if they don't know you right because if you can show that you have put the effort for it so ask for referrals i think uh understanding the fact that no one is going to help you other than yourself is important because if you don't apply and if you don't aggressive about it you're not going to get any interviews and that can be stressful right especially uh, i don't want to go too much on the visa stuff but uh in the us you just have only certain number of days to find a job before your visa expires so that pressure um really piles up when you're searching for jobs and i think uh, it's also fun uh, uh, sorry it's also fun sometimes like there are some events where companies come over and it's not like an indian recruiting process where there's a lot of people with suits and they're very serious and grumpy you know like like very a uh, formal it's more like hey you're cool i think uh, we should talk you know it's just like a very friendly people like they, they're people just because they are interviewing they're not very uh they, they don't think of themselves as like someone like very you know powerful because they know that the job market in the us at least used to be very strong at the currently it's a bit difficult but i think uh that's something i'll go on in a later question but uh it's really fun if you are a little outgoing then you can really go out and you know make connections and it really favors you if you are willing to take the risk you've been volunteering with itp for more than 4 years now today you're the global president for students and young professionals at the itp computer society uh i'd like to know what keeps you going what keeps you inspired to continue this volunteering journey even today as you're a working professional right um, first of all that's six years i've been now uh, even though my linkedin says four years i was in actually for six years because i founded my student branch uh student branch in in calcutta and that's how i started it um but i really would like to spin your question in a different way because it's not about give and take because any relationship which you look at as a transactional way gets very hard to uh, really be successful because if you look at it okay i'm going to spend 3 day 3 days making this thing for i triple and what is i triple going to give me back it's not going to work out anything in your life if you put a transaction nature to it it's people will be able to see you through it so the reason i have been in i triple and i want to be in i triple and probably will continue to be in i triple for a really long time is because what it stands for i believe in being able to empower students and young professionals in the field of computing right it's a cause for me it's something i'm passionate about and i will spend my whole life trying to help make that vision come true i believe that you know irrespective of where you are born what you do what you look like you should have access to opportunities and empowerment and education that's the vision right so for me i triple is not about like what events i'm going to what i'm speaking on what i'm publishing it's really about the shared community where i am trying to help lives of people who i normally would not be able to help sharing my experience and sharing my uh value to these people and that's what it stands for that's what i believe in and i have a whole team uh working for that vision 
So you've spoken about what keeps you going as a volunteer. Uh, as the president of students and young professionals globally, I'd like to know what your tasks look like. What do you do as, as, as the president here? So I lead strategy for IEEE Computer Society's students and young professionals globally, right? So we have tens of thousands of members across the world. And I think uh, I help design how that membership experience will look like. So what kind of uh, opportunities they get to what kind of uh, mentorship, to what kind of resources, funding, project grants. How do I help empower these people? So that's what my job stands for. Right. Yeah. And what I personally like to do is I spend a lot of time with my team brainstorming and designing these programs. We spend a lot of money. Let me tell you, uh, our uh, I think we spend over hundreds of thousands of dollars every year in uh, making the lives of students and professionals better. So we have events in every continent, almost, uh, I think, 20 countries more. There's events happening every month across the world, and we are a global team, really connected. And I, I lead this team, but I think I am a servant for this team because I look at myself as an enabler for my team to help empower these people. Uh, in terms of what I really love to do, I love public speaking, right? So I think this gives me an opportunity to go to a lot of events and my experience allows me to be uh, on positions where I can share my experience to them, right? Uh, in terms of public speaking, in terms of keynotes and workshops. I was just conducting a workshop in France uh, in July and then I plan to be in uh, Brazil in uh, next month for a G20 event and really like, all over the world, right? In Egypt, in America, in San Francisco, uh, Europe, Asia, Australia, you name it, right? So we are running a lot of things and a lot of projects, but everything geared to one purpose is how can we empower that student and that young professional who wants to succeed in their career? How do you manage time between your full-time job at Intel and such a strong uh, commitment towards volunteering at IEEE? I think one advantage I think working in the US has is people accept a lot of work-life balance in general. So I am not expected to work on weekends or I'm not expected to work after 4 p.m. or uh, 4.30 p.m. So my work day ends there, right? And I have pretty much control over how my calendar looks like. So that kind of enables me. I'm not saying it's easy because I spend more than 10 hours a week meeting people. And, you know, sometimes it's even more. It's not easy. But again, it's a purpose which is bigger than me. It's something which is bigger than me. So I'm happy to spend that extra few hours, maybe sometimes cutting down on sleep to get that happening, which is not recommended. But, you know. Uh, sometimes it happens like that. In one of your previous answers, you mentioned that in the US, to score a great job, it's very necessary that you do a lot of networking and for that you need to communicate with a lot of people. It's important that you show recruiters that you're an interesting person to work with, that you're charismatic. Do you think that you had those qualities inherently or is that something that you consciously worked on building? If yes, then how did you do it? He has not been born with it. And I think all the charismatic, uh, extroverted and like very good public speakers are people who are not born with that skill. They have something, something they have developed through intentional practice. Let me tell you, because I was a very shy kid going up in school. I could barely talk to my teacher if I had to use the washroom, for example. That was how shy I was uh, in my school years. And, you know, I think uh, I have actively pursued ways on putting myself in situations I was uncomfortable throughout my life. And that is what helped me. But I'm just saying it wasn't easy. I'm just saying I did not wake up one day and suddenly become a great public speaker. I'm not saying I am a great public speaker. I'm, I'm trying to be better every speech I take. But I'm just saying it wasn't a one day event. And there are a lot of resources available today and a lot of mentorship you could find some people around you who could help you uh, build the skill. But one thing I see, I feel a lot of people get pressured by when they are thinking about public speaking is they have this uh, pressure of saying a lot of things. Like they want to say a lot of things, make really big presentations, a lot of things. I think less is more. Silence is powerful. 
let that sink in. Silence is very powerful. Don't try to oversay things. Don't try to overcomplicate the simple message. Because what people really care about is not you, what you are saying. It's how you are helping them, right? One of my recent uh, articles I wrote was that people don't care what you are or who you are. They care what you have in for them, right? Why is it worth for them to listen to you? Like, why is it worth for someone to listen to this podcast, right? Because it's not about me, right? It's not about me. It's about how I can help them be successful. I believe that what you just quoted is truly food for thought. Uh, having said that, let's move on to the last question of our episode today. What is your advice for aspiring students who really want to build a career in the semiconductor and hardware tech industry? I highly recommend, uh, especially in my field, I think a master's degree is very useful. So trying to get that higher education is very important. I would say it's worth uh, spending a few extra years in school and getting that master's degree. It really pays off in the end. And I really think uh, try to find yourself internship opportunities and even open source projects you can contribute on because that really is where you learn, right? Thanks a lot, Saptarshi, for joining us, for sharing your time, your energy, and so much of your experiences with us. And I'm sure that our audience will find your experiences to be really, really insightful and that this will help in their career journeys as well. Thanks a lot.